Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Ninth Legion, and today let's play some Stellaris. This is the brand new 4X grand strategy game from Paradox Interactive. Uh, if you haven't heard of Paradox before, then you probably haven't ever played a computer game in your life, I guess. That's very rude. But no, they do very good grand strategy games. Crusader Kings 2, Europa Universalis, Heart of Iron. And now they've moved into the sci-fi 4X market with Stellaris. If you haven't played a 4X game before, the 4X part stands for the four main principles. Explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. Explore the universe around you. Explore space, explore planets. Expand, occupy those places, the habitable worlds you find, that kind of thing. Exploit them for their resources and what you need to keep your empire growing. And exterminate by wiping out anyone who tries to get in your way. It's pretty simple, and it's also pretty cool. I like 4X games a lot. This is the first 4X game I think I've played on this channel, though, so I'm kind of excited about it. So, this game came out yesterday. Uh, I've played about 9 hours in total. Uh, I was up until quite late last night. And uh, Let's start a brand new game. So, as with most of these kind of games, we have a selection of different races or peoples we can start as. There's two different human factions, the United Nations of Earth, uh, the Commonwealth of Man, and then you've got the Zin Empire, Kingdom of Yonderim, Ixildar Star Collective, the Chinor Stellar Union, Yehetima Dominion, or the Sildari Confederacy. And as you can see, they've all got various different stats and modifiers. For example, if we look at the standard generic humans, we ha they are an indirect democracy, which means they hold an election every five years to select a new ruler. They have plus one to their leader skill levels, and their leader recruitment cost comes down by minus ten. They're also xenophiles, which means they like other species. So, uh, xenophobia modifier is minus ten. We'll, we're happier to see aliens, basically. And we also have the fanatic individualist trait. Now, this is an interesting one. It gives us plus twenty percent energy credits, but we will not tolerate slavery, and it means that we do have slightly more ethics divergence. And that's something that can come into play later on in the game. Uh, as you can see, we are quick learners. Experience gain is increased by 25% for our leaders. And we're also nomadic, so migration time and resettlement costs are reduced. We start off with nuclear missiles, uh, warp travel, and we have some nifty looking spaceships down here. All of those things will change depending on what race you play as. And you can also create your own brand new race, but I'm not going to do that today. But yeah, for, for example, we look at the Zin Empire, you can see they have mass drivers and warp travel. They are a military dictatorship, so they get more naval capacity, and their ships are cheaper to maintain. They're collectivists, so they prefer, they're actually okay with slavery, and they use less food. Uh, and they're also fanatic militarists, so their army does more damage. Uh, they struggle to get into an alliance, but they get more influence from rivalries, and they're happier being at war. Interesting. This would not be an empire you want to get on the wrong side of, really. But anyway, I don't want to explain too much of this, I want to show it to you guys. So we are going to start off a new game. However, I am going to edit one of the uh, existing ones, rather than creating my own brand new one. I quite like playing as the United Nations of Earth, that sounds pretty cool to me. And I like playing as humans, especially when I start playing a game, because usually they're a bit more middle of the road, not too crazy with their abilities and stuff, so it's easy to learn a game this way. But one thing I do want to do, you can see you can change a lot of things. If you were creating one from scratch, these would be the uh, different selections we could make to create our own brand new species. So I'll quickly just scroll through these so you can see them. Uh, you can have our home world, what type of planets we like, continental worlds, ocean worlds, arctic worlds, tundra worlds, arid worlds, desert worlds, or tropical worlds. We'll leave it on continental worlds, because Earth is a continental world apparently. Uh, the appearance of our cities, government and ethics types, the name of our empire, and the adjectives for our species, the flags we have. I like the UN flag. I think that's actually kind of cool. Uh, and our starting weapons. Now, I've previously done missile weapons, so this is what I'm actually going to change. I want to actually change over to energy weapons on this playthrough. We're going to be going out there with laser beams and having a go with that. Uh, our FTL method, there are three available. Each species gets to choose one at the start. So we are going to go with warp travel. The warp drive generates a, space, a subspace bubble around a ship, making fast and light speeds attainable. This allows for free but relatively slow travel between the stars, given the great distances involved. And it is recommended for new players. It's a fairly straightforward way of travelling around space. You just go from star to star to star, as long as that star is within your warp range. Uh, hyperspace travel is slightly different. 
The hyperdrive allows ships to temporarily breach the dimension of hyperspace. Interstellar travel is fast, but limited to existing paths along the hyperloid network. So it's similar to warp travel, but rather than going wherever you want, each system will be connected to one or possibly more systems by a tunnel, a line that you have to follow. And you can only go to other systems from that system where there's a connection. So it can be quite limiting, uh, but it could be a good way to do. Um, I'm going to stick with warp travel because it's what I've got experience with so far. All nine hours of it that I managed to get yesterday. Uh, and wormhole travel is for advanced players. I'm not going to play around with that just yet, but it does look very interesting. I've seen a good couple of good playthroughs by Quill18, who did wormhole travel in his first let's play. Uh, wormhole generates its tunnel through subspace and establish a conduit between two points, permitting travel across vast distances. The large generators are too big to be fitted on ships, requiring special wormhole stations to operate. So you actually have to build a wormhole station to give you a range from which your ships can then travel. And they will basically go from the wormhole generator to another system and then back again. Uh, it's quite an interesting way of doing it, because um, your ships don't have to carry their own warp drives, which is kind of useful. Uh, and our ship appearance is the last one. We can choose a lot of different things, mammalian ships, reptilian ships, avian ships. We're going to stick with good old mammalian ships. That's good enough for me. So I'm going to save those changes. And we're going to say we're done. So game details. Galaxy size. We're going to start off with a medium sized galaxy in an elliptical formation. There will be 17 AI empires at the start of this. This is the standard generic difficulty level. Uh, there will be four advanced AI starts. This is AI players who are getting a head start on us. They could be larger empires that have been expanding for a while. They could be fallen empires that were once expanding the galaxy and have now fallen in decadence. We will have a normal difficulty because I'm not a madman and I want to play on something stupid like hard where I'm going to lose instantly. And we'll go for the anyone can use any allowed FTL method. We could force everyone to use wormhole travel or hyperdrive or warp but we're just going to allow everyone to do their own thing. So here we go, let's go. That's interesting, I was meant to start recording with this last night, but it didn't happen that way. Here we go. United Nations of Earth. Much has happened since modern humans first emerged in Africa some 200,000 years ago. Our kind spread rapidly across most of the globe, and soon the first civilizations took form. Scientific progress has been swift, though not without cost. Wars claimed millions of lives even before the atom was tamed and the turmoil of the 21st century saw the mandate of the United Nations gradually expanded in an effort to create stability. By the early 22nd century, the supranational organisation had become a de facto world government. Though some still resent the power wielded by the UN, as evidenced during the Mauritian police action of 88, few can deny the technological breakthroughs that have come out of its sponsored research programmes. With the recent completion of the first true starships, mankind is about to embark on a new era of space exploration. Okay. Let us Good day, begin. Madam President. I will turn I a the tutorial off because I kind of know what I'm doing and I don't need a robot talking to me all the time. So we are currently paused and we are looking at the Sol Solar System. And this is actually a pretty decent recreation of it. So you can see we've got Earth here, surrounded by a few orbital stations and some ships. There's the Moon. We've got Saturn and Titan. We've got some asteroids, four Vesta, three Juno, Mars, Mercury, Venus. It's all looking pretty good. Uh, let me just jump out onto the galactic map and this is actually the galaxy this is what we're playing in each of those little dots is a star which we can go to and explore each of those stars has its own planets so we've got 600 stars um, and there's probably about I don't know 3,000 planets in this game if you assume an average of five planets per five planets or moons per system pretty big pretty big but right now we're only in Sol. Uh, as you can see, our nearby neighbourhood is quite small. We've got Barnard Star over here and Alpha Centauri over here. And that's all we know about. That's all that's within our current range. So, let's have a look. What we need to do first is survey our home system. We don't have any survey detail on these planets. We don't know what's there. Now, to help us with that, we do have some handy science ships. The UNS Equinox, commanded by Elsa Kruger. She's one of our scientists. She is a resilient scientist. She has a leader lifespan of plus 25 years, so she should live longer. Your characters will age and die is one of the important things in this game. So, let's tell her to start off surveying the system. Uh, go to the moon first. So if we tell her to survey the system, there you go, she automatically generates her own flight path. It's not the most 
organized in the world, but it'll do. It'll work. So she's going to go there first and have a look around. We've also got a construction ship. Now this construction ship can build things for us, but we have to find something for it to build on. And currently we don't have anything for that, so it's not going to do anything. Right now, it's in Earth orbit, which is a handy thing for it to be in, because that means it's not using up as much energy or minerals. It reduces the upkeep of the ship, basically. Uh, where does it say? Maintenance, 0.75 units of energy. So in Stellaris, we have a couple of main resources. We have energy credits, we have minerals, and we have influence. And they all work for different things. And they're going to come into play quite a lot later on. Uh, we have no research undergoing at the moment, so let's sort that out before we unpause the game. So we have three scientists working in three different fields. Jackie Hood for physics, Michelle McNiven for society research, and Teresa Decker for engineering. Um, Jackie Hood is a specialist in field manipulation, so she'll get a 10% bonus to working in that area. Michelle McNiven is an expert in statecraft, so she gets a 10% bonus. And Teresa Decker is just a much longer lived scientist than the rest. So what are we going to research first? Uh, we could... Ooh, blue laser. Interesting. Or solar panel network. So blue lasers is a weapon option, clearly. Ah, this is handy. Okay. So Jackie Hood has the field manipul manipulation trait. So if we research this, she's going to research 10% faster than she would normally. Let's take that. Right. I think for Michelle McNiven, the first thing we're going to need, as my voice breaks on me, sorry, we're going to need a colony ship. We can't exp expand to other worlds until we have a colony ship. Not that we've found anyone to colonize yet, but hey, they're out there. I have faith. I believe. And for physics, let's see. Ion thrusters could be useful. Increases the sublight speed of our ships. Yeah, work on that for me. Faster ships are good ships. That's our technology screen. We also have a situation log, there's nothing in that right now. A ship designer, contacts for when we make contact with people. We have an empire overview, currently looking at Earth. We can see our governor here, we can see our populations, and we can see our government types over here. Budget policies, which we can enact, and this is where our influence comes into play. We can spend influence to enact various policies, like an information quarantine. Uh, stops our population from having different ideas and forming their own factions, but does slow down our research speed. Or we can do the opposite, increase our research speed, but have more ethics divergence. Give grants to various things. That wouldn't actually be bad. I mean, we've got plus floor at four influence right now. If we could enact, let's see, I wouldn't mind getting this colony ship done really fast. So, if we could boost our society research by 30%. Oh no, it does slow down the other two as well though. Yeah, I don't quite want to do that just yet. Okay. And we have our various policies up here, as you can see. First contact protocol is peaceful. Leadership is for primary species only. So if we have more than one species in the, the Empire, only humans will be able to be the leaders. Uh, everyone has the free votes. Resettlement is prohibited. I can't force people to move to another planet, but they can choose to because we have free migration enabled. Uh, we're not allowed to purge, we can't do slavery, and our war economy is static. Uh, which is probably the best way to do it right now. So, with that, the only thing we need to do now is take a look at Earth. So this is our planet, a continental world. Habitability, 100%. With a maximum of 7 tiles. Wow, that... Oh no, population of 7, 16 tiles. That's not great, because there are much bigger planets out there. If you look at the surface of the planet, you can see we have these buildable tiles. Each of these little people here is a head of population, and they are working that tile for us. So we've got some money and minerals to spend. What we can do, and what I would like to do, is we're going to build in this tile. That is a minerals, a base of free minerals being collected by that population. I can boost that by building a mining network, which will produce another two on that tile. You can only have one building per tile, but that will mean we get five minerals out of that one. As you can see, this tile already has a uh, mining network built here. So they've got one for the base tile, they've got two for the mining network. And because they're adjacent to this building, the Planetary Administration, they also get another plus one. So building around the Planetary Administration is a really good thing. 
We also have a few other tiles here, uh, which are blocked by terrain details, in this case sprawling slums. This region is covered by vast shanty towns and slums filled with the poor and outcasts. It contributes nothing to society. Your home world will always have a bunch of these. Other worlds you colonize will not. They'll have a variety of other terrain blockers. Uh, and you can research ways of removing them and then pay energy and minerals to actually clear them. But I'm not going to worry about that right now. I don't want to spend too much money. I want to save my money for other projects. So let's unpause the game. And we should be able to see. There we go. Our science ship is moving off. The UNS Equinox. And she is doing science, scanning the moon, and hopefully going to find us some interesting things, some minerals, some energy credits, or nothing at all. There we go. Yeah, that was a failure. The, the moon is a barren world with nothing for anyone, which is a shame. But okay, the UNS Equinox is going to continue surveying the rest of the system for us. While they're doing that, we do have one other fleet we haven't talked about yet. Our military fleet. First fleet. Made up of three corvettes, UNS Fetch, UNS Sea Lion, UNS Arbe. Currently, we have no Admiral assigned to this fleet, but I'm not going to worry about that right now, because I'm not expecting to get into massive amounts of combat. But if we go back to the galactic map, you can see this ring around here. This is the range of our warp drive. And we're going to do a little bit of early scouting around Sol to try and find out basically what's around here. We have an idea of what's in this system because it's within our sensor radius. This little kind of greeny blue inner circle here is our sensor radius from Sol. So we kind of know that there's nothing there. So we're going to instead send them to jump out to Alpha Centauri. There we go. They've got to get away from the gravity well that's generated by the planets and the sun. So they've got to move outside of this grey dotted line here before they can make a warp jump. Oh! What the hell are you? Hang on, did I go for... Why is there a wormhole station? I thought we went warp. Did I change to wormholes? Oh crap, I changed to wormholes, didn't I? Okay, well... We're doing wormholes, people. <laughs> that was a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. But, oh well. I wanted to stay on warp travel. I must have clicked it to talk to you guys about it and then not realised... So, this is going to be how wormholes work. We have a wormhole station, and our ships are going to use it to travel outside. There they go. And this is quite a quick way of moving. So, they're going to basically disappear from Sol, and almost instantly reappear in Alpha Centauri. There we go. Jumped straight across. And we've actually found some planets. What have we got here? Oh, wow. Alpha Centauri is already looking good. So, you can see a number of planets on the inner system, but two of them have these little grey worlds by them. We have one desert planet, Alpha Centauri 4. We also have another continental world. That is our species type of preferred world that we can automatically colonise at the beginning of the game. So having that so close by, that's really good. And luckily there's no bad guys here. Okay, well, in that case, you guys can head somewhere else. So this is our wormhole radius, not our warp range, now that I've realised what system we're using. Um, so if we say I want you to go and explore this system, Procyon, Procyon, they have to go back to Sol and then jump out again. They don't have to travel between, but they do have to travel back and forth. So it's a little, it's kind of faster, kind of slower. This is going to be interesting. I didn't intend to do that, but I've done it. Okay, our survey ship, while all that's been going on, all that chaos of me getting the wrong warp, uh, the wrong FTL travel, we've actually found some resources on Mercury. Some pretty good resources, actually. There's three minerals on that planet. So, we're going to send our construction ship over there. And they're going to start building me a mining station. And you can see the silhouette there of where it's going to be. And that will gather those three resources for me and add them to my pole up here. So currently we're plus 10 on minerals. That will bring us up to plus 13. Looks like two palace didn't have anything for us, unfortunately. What about Uranus? Is Uranus going to have anything for us? Or Uranus? Depends just where you want to say it. I'm going to say Uranus because I don't want to say Uranus all the time. That's probably going to annoy some people in the comments. Nope. There's nothing there for us. Okay, Procyon's got another world. A tomb world. 
Okay. Never actually colonized the Tomb World yet, so I'm not quite sure what that's going to mean. This is a rocky world with a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere. It is currently experiencing a nuclear winter with dense layers of sooty aerosols in the atmosphere. High levels of surface radiation and minimal signs of life, but it is quite a large world. 24 tiles. Bear in mind, Earth currently only has 16. Hmm. Okay. But uh, other than that, only a couple of planets and a few asteroids here. Not much else. Still, I'm kind of liking this chain of planets. Let's head out to there with our fleet. They don't really have anything else to do right now. And we can see them here. This is where they're warping back in. So the wormhole station is creating the tunnel for them to come home. Which is pretty handy. Our construction ship is working on our mining station. And that's a pretty good find. I have had a start before on the previous game I played yesterday where we had no resources in the uh, in our starting system. That was not a fun start. You're scanning Mars. You can see here the progress meter. Yeah, Mars, no luck. Unfortunately, we can't colonize Mars either. And our fleet is now in Diob. Interesting. What's in Diob? Looks like we've got another... Uh, desert world. Okay, we can't colonize that, but it's something we can try and research later on. Good number of planets, a bunch of moons as well. Might be some good resources there. Our military can't survey. They can only... Basically, we're just popping in to have a look. But it's nice to get a good idea. I mean, we know we want to go to Alpha Centauri first, because there's a planet there we can colonize. Uh, let's go back to Sol. What we want to see is more resources being found by our side ship. Because otherwise we're soon going to run out of work for our construction ship here. Free Juno? Come on. Fingers crossed for Free Juno. How long do you got left? Wow, that's... No, I'm paused. I was going to say that's taking forever, but I didn't realise I was paused. Even though it was saying at the bottom of the thing I was paused. No, Free Juno, nothing for us. That's a shame. How are you doing? What's your progress like? 61%. Okay, you're getting there. Research is slowly continuing. We've got quite a long time. Research in this game can be very slow. Construction complete. Oh, Earth has finished its construction queue. That's good. So you can see here we've got 36 months on this project, 63 months for colonization, and that's with the 10% bonus from it being her type of research. No, no, sorry, that's wrong. Jackie Hood gets the 10% bonus, so that's 36 months. And Teresa Decker's on 40 months, so they're going to be a while working on that. Okay, what we were building on Earth has finished. So if we go back to looking at the surface, we can see here this tile is now producing three, uh, five minerals instead of three for us. That's pretty good. Where do we want to build next? We've got... We're floating some minerals. We can probably afford another building right now, especially as we haven't found anything else in the solar system to build a mining station on. Surface buildings are cheaper than mining stations, so it can be worthwhile doing them first. I'm going to build more food here. The population growth, where, as you can see here, we have a population that's growing. Growth progress of 6.5 out of 45.3, they're growing a point, uh, plus one per month. That is That rate of growth is determined by how much food is available. If we look at the planetary summary, we have two surplus food. So... If we, the more food we have surplus, the faster the population will grow. So here, as you've got a food tile, we will build a hydroponics farm, which will give us enough another two food for a total of three. Okay, let that continue to work. Where's my military fleet? Where did I send them? They're in Seoul. They're still heading to Fangor. Situation. Oh, okay, here we go. Encounter in Fancor. We've encountered some form of alien vessels in the Fancor system. These strange objects have been flagged as sharkies until we can learn more about them. We should proceed with caution. Okay, so this is going to give us a special project, Investigate Sharkies. Contact report, Enigmatic Spacefarers. The United Nations of Earth has finally encountered fellow wanderers among the stars. Despite their intentions being unknown and potentially even hostile, the atmosphere on Earth following the report from our contact fleet can best be described as rapturous. Now this is where the game 
specializes itself around the player. Because we are xenophiles and we like the idea of finding aliens, this is the description we get. If we were xenophobes, we would have a different description. We, you know, people wouldn't be very excited about finding alien life. Okay, so what have we got here? Alien vessels in Fancor. They are amber, which means if they were red, they'd be hostile. Oh no, that's my fleet. Hang on. There, uh, here we go. Some kind of strange alien life form. And they're doing something. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they are. But what else is in Fenkor, actually? Is there anything else in this system for us to look at? No oh, habitable worlds, unfortunately. A couple of planets, a few asteroids. Not the worst thing to find in the world. This world is actually just outside of the range of our wormhole system. So we can't actually go to Hull Jam. But we'll continue working our way We need to explore all of the planets within our wormhole radius. So let's go to unknown number 154, which is a fantastic name. Now, if we look at our situation log, we do have a special mission available to investigate the Sharkies. We need to learn more about the mysterious aliens we have codenamed Sharkies. If they possess a language, we must decipher it and establish communications. This is a special project we can begin. It will use, as you can see here, our society researcher, but it will only take three months, and she's currently working on a project that's going to take 63 months, so I think three months out of that isn't the end of the world. So. We will apply that. Oh, sorry, it's not three months. Uh, six months, okay. It's still, in the grand scheme of things, not too bad. So she is now investigating there. If we look back here, busy with a special project, investigate Sharkies, and that will tell us more about them and possibly open up more special missions. How are we doing in Sol? Our fleet's coming back in, which is good. Where's my science vessel? There you are. And we've built our first mining station. The UNS Tigris completed the construction of a mining station in orbit of Mercury. Now, you don't have anything else to do because we haven't been able to find anything else for you. But if we look here, you can see our shiny mining station. Busy working hard. Let's get the Tigris back. Now, because we unfortunately we don't have anything else for them to do at the moment, I'm going to put them back in orbit so they cost us lower maintenance fees. I'm quite liking the whole wormhole system, actually. I know it was a mistake on my part, and it probably sounded very stupid. Oh, oh dear. Encounter in Rijin. We have encountered some form of alien vessels in the Rijin system. These strange objects have been flagged as Onis until we can learn more about them. We should proceed with caution. Oh, we found a second alien species. Ah. Okay. Now, they're red, which means they are hostile. So we want to stay away from them. You can see here, the military power is basically an estimate of the combined defensive and defensive capabilities of the fleets. So they've got a figure of 178. Our current military, our entire military, has a rating of 69. So they would kill us so very, very easily. And luckily, they're on the far side of the solar system from us, so we can just get out of here. Uh, but yeah, they are definitely hostile to us. I would, I think we need to go. Let's go to Wildcore, see if that's any better for us. And at this point, I'm going to start queuing up a few orders. So by holding Shift, I can basically tell them to go to multiple locations at once. Let's let's basically get the uh, what's going to be the inner ring of human space in the future. Let's get all that have a, had a look at. Go back to Sol. Looks like you are currently scanning Titan. Is Titan going to have anything for us? Saturn, unfortunately, did not. So our mining ship, our construction ship, rather, is heading home. Anomaly found. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, we found an anomaly on Titan. During the survey of our home system, we found something on Titan that did not match earlier observations made from our homeworld. This is a level 1 anomaly with a 0% failure risk. Wow, okay. That's really low. I've never seen a 0% before on a level 2 scientist, but okay. We will, we're going to research that right away. This could be something interesting. It could be some new technology. It could be a start of an event chain that could lead us to new things. It could be resources that had been missed before. So we'll conduct this research now. 
It's going to slow down the whole surveying the solar system bit, but I think that's going to be quite important. So how long is this? Is, this is going to take quite a while for you to do. And investigating anomalies is much slower than surveying planets. Not too bad, it's just a little bit slower. Our construction ship is back in orbit of Earth, nice and safe. And our military fleet, where are you? You're currently in Sol, about to head out again into the deep black. But I think this episode has run on long enough, so I'm going to take a break here. Thank you guys for watching this, I hope you do enjoy it. Uh, Stellaris looks to be a very good game, so there should be a lot of us to, not for us to play and see with here. If you did enjoy this, do feel free to leave a like, leave a comment, and subscribe, and hopefully I'm going to see you all later for the next one. Bye.